Welcome to the Better at Beach Volleyball podcast. My name is Mark Burke, and you are here to get better at beach volleyball. Today, we have an amazing guest. She actually runs one of the most successful beach volleyball clubs in the country, and she is widely touted as one of the most successful directors and coaches that we have on the sand in our country. And we're lucky to have her uh, in our country, actually, because she was on the Colombian national team from 1978 and 79. She played at UCLA. She had a 16-year professional beach career. And I just absolutely cannot wait to get into this conversation. So if you are a club director, if you're a coach, if you're a volleyball parent or a player, this episode, this interview is going to light you up and i don't want to wait anymore so without further ado hello patty dodd how are you hi mark thank you for the introduction and i sure hope we can light up the, the audience so go ahead and <laughs> fire up the questions <laughs> nice well uh first of all let's just talk a little bit briefly about your history so Columbia national team, right? You moved here. You ended up at, at UCLA. Just could you could you go briefly through what that was like and any differences uh, that you see from that time when you started uh, in the in the seventies, eighties until now? What do you think the major differences are if you were to have the same experience today? Okay, so I um, started at UCLA in uh, 1980, and it was not until 1982 that it was the first NC2A. So I think the biggest difference from pre-NC2A to, pre to NC2A is that there were not a lot of regulations in the amount of hours that you could practice. So uh, the schedules were pretty crazy, and... Um, you know, sometimes we're practicing three, four hours a day, and it was very taxing on, on our bodies. But uh, but definitely not no complaints. I had a great experience at UCLA under Andy Benkowski. He was there for many many years, and we were always in contention for for nationals. Uh, you know, being in the final four every every year that I was there. And my fifth year, actually, I I became a, a graduate assistant coach. And that's really what ignited my butt to uh, to be a coach. We won the sc 2 as that year. And I just thought that, wow, if, if what I can say can help somebody perform better, it was um, it was just magical to me. And I, I knew that at some point I wanted to coach. I love that. So you knew kind of while you were playing, it fired you up while you were playing that you wanted to. I know from my experience i mean my first job was when i was 13 and i was coaching sports i was coaching like little tykes at you know the day sports mm -hmm. camp so mm -hmm. i i don't know if i if i was like born for it uh or i just found it so early and got really comfortable and people you know asked me to do it more so i just kept following that path but i do know it's 100 percent of passion and it doesn't even have to be really in sport or actually i don't know you know, because I've never coached outside of sport, but the only opportunity I've had now is to help my brother with his small business and a few other people with their small businesses, which maybe is the next evolution. But do you think that you were born as a coach or is it just something that that's the path that you followed and it became an opportunity after some success and good feelings? So certainly that experience of being in the NC2As and, and winning and being a graduate assistant coach that definitely had planted the seed in that that's something that fell right. Mm -hmm. um, I then after that I competed professionally in Italy and in, and in the pro tour in, in beach. So I didn't have time to coach. Uh, but you know, as uh, as you well know, in, in professional, especially beach volleyball, the money at the time uh, wasn't great, so I needed to have a job. So I did teach for a long time, and I think between my uh, degree in psychology from UCLA and then teaching elementary school for a long time really, really prepared me to be the coach that I am today because coaching is teaching, and uh, teaching school really teaches you management and organization, and I think those are really important skills for a coach. Nice. Now you have a studly 
lineup of coaches for MB Sand, mm -hmm. right? Like just absolute. I mean, people who are crushing it on the national tour and the AVP tour. Do you, what do you think? Do you think that there's value in learning to coach or coaching while playing? Or is that, you know, for, for those players, is that just a necessity and an opportunity to stay on the beach and not have to travel to multiple places so they're actually saving time? You know, is, is there that value that, that players get from coaching? I mean, I, I always thought that if I knew when I was 22, what I know today, that I would have had a better, a better uh, career. So there is a huge value in coaching to make you a better player because you see things from a different perspective. And uh, I mean, I certainly can tell because, you know, on, on occasion we have sub coaches because somebody's sick or we have too many kids or something like that. And I can certainly tell when the coach is there just for the paycheck versus the coach is there because they're truly enjoying and they're teaching. So, you know, we uh, uh, when you say we have a really great staff, I, I mean to say that these guys are in it for the right reasons. And I think that in turn makes them uh, better players. I do like that. You know, part of what I struggled with, you know, and, and I'm looking kind of back at, at a long career now, is that I, I coached a ton while playing and it was to me like that part of it was valuable is valuable because it, when you coach you become better you make sure that you're doing things that certain way part of what i did i think is i probably spent too many hours coaching just to try to get like some bit ahead with 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 rent and expenses and maybe physically that exhausted me but uh, repeating needing to get answers that I was assured of. I always play devil's advocate with myself, right? So anytime I hear something or I say something, the little guy inside me immediately challenges it. And he says, well, how would somebody challenge this? And then I need to come up with an answer for that. And then there's a challenge to that answer. And so I always come up with reasoning. And then that leads me to, for some people, I think they get stuck, right? They just sit there and they go, well, it's just the way. Uh, for me, I always needed to say, no, 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 I, I need logic. I need answers. I need to watch, you know, hundreds of these plays in slow motion to make sure that's what the world's best players are doing. And then I would go, you know, uh, to guys like Mike Dodd, Jeff Alzina, Rich Lamborn, and I would say, hey, uh, is this right? Are we doing this right? Can you take a look at this and, and tell me what's going on? So I, I, I don't know whether people as pro players should coach a ton but I think they should all get good at sharing their knowledge because it's going to grow the game to the next level. Yeah, so I, I think what you said about the long hours was probably really taxing on your body because coaching can be very exhausting. So one thing is to do a two-hour practice. Another thing is to maybe do two hours and then four privates and then you're on your feet thinking and concentrating and then to try and then do a two-hour practice for yourself as a player, I, I just can't imagine doing that because being on your feet and focusing can be very demanding. So, uh, you know, if you are a player out there that's also coaching, I, I recommend to maybe limit it to two to three hours of coaching so that you can still get your workout and perhaps get your workout in before you coach because going the other way around is very difficult uh on your on your body i completely agree with that right you, you take all of those calories for the, what's the most important for, thing for you right now and physically should be for your training if you're playing mm -hmm. at that time so get that yeah. get your practice out of the way first get your lift out of the way first mm -hmm. and then you'll be better and i think it i think a lot of young coaches end up hammering a lot of balls during practices. And then you'll see a lot of experienced coaches mm -hmm. do some more player initiated drills. They learn how to use their assistant coaches as well. But uh, we did a, a whoop study, me and Brandon, like a, you know, a two person whoop study. But when we played like a three team side out 
uh, practice, basically like the king of the court for two hours. And then we actually coached like a private lesson or a small group for the same two hours. We burned more calories coaching mm -hmm. than we did in our own practice. And we're like, oh, this this is important for us to look at here. You know, like maybe we're working too hard as coaches. Of course, our brains are constantly working because you're solving eight people's problems at once. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of calorie burn there. But I, I think a lot of young coaches could be served with being okay letting players mm -hmm. pick up the ball from the ground and initiate that drill. Yeah, I, I so agree with that. And I think sometimes, you know, as coaches, we want – practice to look pretty because it's pleasing to our eyes, maybe there's an audience of parents or something like that. So, um, and it can be ugly. Practices can be really ugly until the players, depending on their level of experience, learn how to toss correctly or introduce a ball into, into the drill. And we just gotta be comfortable with that fact factor of ugliness and messiness because believe it or not they do get better at tossing they do get better at introducing the ball and every time that we as coaches are hitting a ball rolling a ball serving a ball to initiate a drill we're stealing a rep from our players and all every touch is valuable and you got to maximize the 160 minutes or however many sorry 120 minutes that you have your kids at practice i i love the way you put it because i usually put it the same way when working with other coaches i say you can't steal reps from your players mm -hmm. you know every time you serve if if you have a line of eight players and you're serving so that each one of them passes mm -hmm. you are getting eight times as many reps as the players on your court and it's yes. like, yeah, you might keep them moving, but you're not actually getting them more repetitions. Like you are getting more repetitions than them. And so what if they miss, you know, like if, if you have a group of, of girls or guys that are missing serves, all right. So you're not getting the passing reps every time, but at least you're getting some serving reps and obviously they need it if they're missing so frequently. Yeah, absolutely. Just be comfortable with practice being ugly. Mm. I like that. And I think more people need to hear it. We, we ran into some experiences where we had uh, some players who came straight out of college. And for whatever reason, their club or their college team, they ran very complicated rotation-based drills where like, you have to hit here, then you have to go to your next spot before this ball lands, and then you have to go to the back of the line and switch with this person. And Brazilian, Brazilian style. <laughs> well, there are some practices, like Brazilian practices, that are high reps, right? Yeah. They don't always have to be complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but if it's if it's complicated, and your your girls or your or your boys or what whoever you're coaching, if they can't have the basics of pass and set down, if they're not nine out of ten with putting the ball where they want to right now then adding these crazy rotations and new positions every other play so that like they get an even amount of reps to me we we completely wiped out we simplified all of our drills mm -hmm. we said no 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 don't have them stay in one spot for 5 minutes like you're a passer for 5 minutes you're a setter for 5 minutes that's not terribly game like so I'll, I'll catch some flack from that in the comments but at least they're not so worried about where they have to be next and they're getting reps. So that's the way that I do it. But I want to know like what style you guys use. Are you, are you pretty basic? Do you have a, you know, these are my five drills that we use at MB sand and these are the best ones. Or are you guys constantly creating new drills with, uh, to, to keep the girls, their minds fresh? Um, no, I, I think there is a truth to that. There are some basic drills that we use a lot, but then there is variations of it. So, for example, one drill that we love at NBCN is uh, star setting, where you have um, two lines of setters, one on the right, one on the left, and then we have a catcher, and then this, the, the setting is constantly happening this way. So you get to, especially in, in South Bay Wind, 
um, maybe one side gets to sit with the wind under their back for a while, and then the other side is getting to sit into the wind, and that can be done in system one day. Uh, that can be done with just hand setting one day. On another day, it could be the same drill, but it's done with bump setting. On another day, instead of being in system tosses, now, and this is the one drill that we don't mind the coach uh, introducing the ball. It keeps a nice rhythm, but also because then the coach has the ability to toss out of system um, uh, looking like passes because we don't want our players to pass poorly. And so maybe the start setting drill on another day is going to be, we're going to work on side sets, we're going to work on back sets, we're going to work on sets out of the net, we're going to work on sets from far away from the net. So literally that same drill probably has about 12 variations. Are we running tempo today? Are we running up and down? So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's an incredibly valuable drill to us. And I think that we do that a lot with different drills where there is a slight variation to it. But I think when uh, the players are familiar with the drill, it saves on explaining. And again, your 120 minutes, like you've seen, 120 uh, minutes are so valuable that, that when I watch sometimes practices because it has to consult, a very common mistake is the coach will explain the drill on the sidelines. Now the kids get put on the court and then the, the, code, the, the drill gets explained again. And I'm like, oh, Lord. And then, put it in the and then now we waste. Now, I don't want to say wasted, but this explanation has become about seven minutes. When mm -hmm. it could have been two minutes, you got to do your explanations with the players on the court, maybe even mimicking or maybe doing a little dry run of it so that, boom, you're on the ball within three minutes. And if the kids, if I say start drill, the kids know where to line up. Okay, today we're working on sets out of the net. Boom. And then now my focus for them is how do we set out of the net? And I'm not wasting time explaining how star setting works. So I think that's really, really important is that our explanations are short, concise. And if you have a drill that the kids are familiar with and you have variations, then all you got to explain is that variation on that given day. I, I'm so happy you're saying that because it, it makes me feel like I'm moving in the right direction for coaching because the, the camps that we run like down in Florida, we, we, I'm a bunch of, you know, similar. We have a lot of AVP guys and girls coaching our camps and it's, Hey, I know that you're familiar with this drill, but they are not, this is completely new to them. So I say, you never explain the drill and then put them in position. You, you, you grab people by the name. You say, hey, Jerry, you're here. Jack, you're here. You're the setter. You're the passer, right? And then, like, you make them move with the drill. And then they're already doing it by the end of your explanation. It's not like you're finished yes. explaining and then they start it. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. We, um, mm -hmm. we <laughs> I saw that problem consistently happening, and this is, like, a, a little push for – for something that we have, but we have uh, 53 practice plans on mm -hmm. our website where it's betterbeach.com forward slash practice plans for anybody who's listening. But that's what we do. And, and we thought that it might be easy for people who are starting to say, hey, send your practice plan that you're going to do tomorrow to your kids tonight. So at least they'll get mm -hmm. like a first view of it. And then you'll know if they're actually studying and like doing the extra credit. If you're like, hey, uh, we're doing star drill today. Right, everybody line up, let's get into star drill. And mm -hmm. man, if they have something like this, like a video or at least a diagram, at least for for new clubs and when you're at the beginning of the year or you're running tryouts or something, this can be really nice. If you see the people who are completely lost and you're like, oh, you didn't look at anything I sent you. <laughs> you know, maybe you're not doing your at-home homework. Um, so I, this is something that we create beach it's uh, betterbeach.com forward slash practice plans uh for anybody who wants to look at recorded videoed drills um or any diagrams of it but i i know that you're now coaching for beach nation so 
could you tell us a little bit about Beach Nation? I, I do want to get back to MB Stan and, and really talk about like California girls and indoor versus beach, but I, I'd love to hear more about Beach Nation. Yes, yeah, so uh, Beach Nation um, came out uh, four years ago, and then obviously with COVID, we had um, one almost you know one and a half summers were not half years were not a lot happen but uh beach nation is a um company that does education for both coaches uh, it's only beach and and for uh players uh when uh, a typical clinic for us is that we let's say we go to we have one in clear water uh in november so we arrive and then on day one the evening usually is a friday night the coaches come in for two hours and uh we have a manual that the coaches get and uh, we go through all the fundamentals and it's very interactive there is a lot of q a uh the next day those coaches get to attend the player clinic and be very hands-on with the players um I love that. Some of them can be a little bit shy and they're afraid to give feedback other ones want to jump right in uh, side by side with college coaches because the um, the clinic for the players is all done uh, by college coaches. They're very interested in being in front of a college coach because it's a potential recruiting opportunity. So we have to Oh, practice. wow. Yeah. So, so it's kind have... of like three. So, so you're training coaches, uh, you're training players, and it's kind of a showcase event for yes. the players the coaches. So, oh, and but, it doubles for the college coaches too because they're teaching and they're recruiting. That's yes. nice. That's so there's, everybody benefits, but I think what separates a Beach Nation showcase from other showcases is that most showcases is literally a tournament and play. Uh, mm -hmm. Sometimes they might have a little clinic the night before where we train the athletes for seven hours, five hours on day one, two hours on the morning of day two and then the showcases that afternoon so then the college coaches really get to work with the players get to know the players we don't uh, have the top group work with Todd Rogers only everybody <laughs> rotates and and we get you know all kinds of amazing uh, college coaches there and so the kids rotate the coaches stay put so every drill the kids rotate so they get to see all the coaches and within those seven hours, the uh, the coaches that are learning, um, they get to also they can either rotate or stay on a specific court and jump in as much as they can or not. And uh, yeah, so that's basically what we do at Beach Nation. It benefits the coach that is learning. It benefits the college coach that's recruiting, and it certainly benefits the player that wants to be seen by by these coaches and get an opportunity to work with them uh and when i say them not just one but it could be anywhere from six to ten depending right. on how big the camp is right now when you so i, I have two questions there that immediately came up when you're uh, training other coaches what are the top two things that you guys say the most when you're helping out uh, you know either high school or club or new coaches do you guys have anything that you're always on repeat that you just wish everybody could hear or stop doing in their practices or before their practices or what have you i think number one uh young coaches talk too much okay so you know the explanations are too long the explanations have too many things for the player to try and focus on. And I think that when you give a player, you know, four or five things to work on is is about four too many. So- And then one, even during the drill, right? It's like, it, it, so some of them will do it before practice and they'll say, and do focus on this and focus on this and focus on this. It's like, wait a second, that's not focusing. As soon as you said the second thing, that's not focusing. Yeah. Um, but then they'll do it like they'll make one mistake and whatever goal or key they gave them at the beginning of practice, they don't even speak to that. It's like, wait yeah. a second. I thought you just told him that this practice was about, you know, setting or using your legs to set. And now you're commenting on his hitting. Exactly. So this player is lost. Yeah. And I just think that it's human nature. <clears throat> if we're into coaching is because we very, we, 
we are caring human beings. And I think it's human nature to see, for example, the, the example of, is it, are we working on the footwork or the hand working setting? And the, now I'm, I'm trying to, to teach both. It's human nature to want to help and want to give too much. But honestly, the best thing, and you kind of have to bite your tongue because you, know, you see the kid going up there with perfect hands, yet the feet are wrong. Well, bite your tongue and then, you know, compliment the kid on the fact that, you know, whatever, their shape was perfect, their follow through finish was perfect, whatever. And then in the next round, we're going to concentrate on the feet. But just don't be feeding on two, three different things. Uh, I think that's what if you asked me, which were the, the two things. I said number one is that feeding the kid too many things, the coach is talking too much. I think another one that's, uh, that's really important is the type of feedback. There is a lot of nice hit nice uh, serve. And that feedback is not specific enough. I just think that if we can get better at giving feedback, it's like, I like how you loaded your your arm that time, or I like how your hands were up early on your set. is better than nice, because I think the kids see the result, and they, they see that it was nice. But what was nice about it? So I think uh, as coaches, giving uh, feedback that's specific is is better than nice. Yeah, it, or when somebody hits a hard ball for the first time, and you say nice. It's like, yeah. Why? It's, what you know, what it's made it hard. that way is the yes, only thing you need to know. Hard. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. yeah, you don't need to massage my ego. You need to tell me how to do it again. I mean, okay. Sometimes you need to make somebody feel good for the first time in a while. You know, fire them up. A little bit. the boys. The boys just want to come and hit it hard. <laughs> I think, man, it's it's got to be way tougher to run a teenage beach practice for boys than for girls, just because, like, just by nature of the shag. Like having a collectible, I remember me in high school, I would literally hit a back wall of our gym and guys on the team would be like, sick, man, that was such a hard hit. And my coach is there with his eyes and his hands saying like, it has to go in, you know, yeah. <laughs> to be yeah. good. Or you like, always want to try and play hoops with the cart. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And then like without any ball nets or walls there, that's... Yeah. But if they don't get, boys on the beach, they don't put it in, I always have some ammo to tease the kids. Hey, stick to volleyball. <clears throat> Maybe hoops is not for you. I they know that I'm talking. <laughs> I like that. Okay. So recap, uh, coaches, don't talk too much. Uh, do you do you put a timer on them? Do you do you do you like start a stopwatch when you're leading them and say, hey, you're talking too much, or is it just a feeling that you get when you're consulting the coaches? Uh, no, no, no. I, I have put a clock, but I, I will never do it um, in the practice in front of the kids. Okay. Uh, no, I think it's really important to never shame in public. So it's more watch the practice and then have a conversation after. Uh, often I would ask, hey, how do you think, how long do you think your explanation of extra was? And they're usually off by about 50%. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I and I think often, you know, the, the whole thing about having one thing, maybe two things to focus on is is the kids, you know, they explain the drill. Now the kids are off to do the drill. And I will interview a couple of the kids really quick. It's, it's not a sit down interview. Oh. Uh, what are you focusing on? And most of the time they don't know. So that tells you right there that the explanation was too long and not concise. I like that. I really like that. How if 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 a coach is is in a club or you know they're they're just running their own practices, running lessons, how can they do that for themselves when you're not there? Like if you're not there to guide them, oh, it's easy. Like own in the public park. Easy, easy. Put your phone over there. You don't even need a tripod. Put your phone against something and record your practice. And I mean, when you record your own practices, just like we learn so much from uh, watching, uh, you know, 
a volleyball game, about our approach, about our setting, about our footwork, it's the same thing. You're going to learn so much uh, about your coaching uh, process um, when you videotape your practices. Yeah, you, you, you're gonna, you yeah. need a consultant there. And you're going to start seeing, oh, dang, yeah, that was really long. Or wait a minute, I could have done that better. I think I, I can say it in fewer words. I think that's key to speak in fewer words, concise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, you, if you're a coach and you watch a video of your own practice and you're so bored that you have to fast forward because it's just a pile, <laughs> a pile of sand, yes. like, yes. that's like got to be your answer, right? <laughs> you're sitting there and you're like, oh, my God, how long were we in this circle? Can we fast forward? The second that you want to fast forward, that's the second that the kids wanted to fast forward when they wanted to start playing. Yeah. And the beauty of beach volleyball is that you have a built-in whiteboard on the sand. Literally. I mean, we draw on the sand all the time just to get things moving, moving faster and explain things. Yeah. I like that. All right. Nice. That's, that's a good tip for coaches. How about for anybody listening or, or parents who are out there and like the top two mistakes you see the kids making at these tryouts or showcases like what is what is the mistake that a recruitee could be making that you guys are seeing noticing that you think man you just ruined yourself for all these coaches i think that a lot of kids get very nervous mm. and instead of just play volleyball all you can control is your effort in the next play so work about your past mistake is only just going to pile and carry on to the next place so um you know if you are one of those kids that has anxiety or uh, you know start trying to work on that during practice during a regular tournament that's not a showcase with a bunch of college coaches there uh work on either meditation or visualization some things that are going to help you you know just just calm down. Um, I think, you know, playing and looking at the coach or playing and looking at the parent is also not a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, just let, let the game happen like it should happen and uh, be very supportive of your partner. Coaches want to see how players recover from their mistakes, how supportive they are of their partners because, you know, if you have you have a great player, but they're blaming their partner. Not a lot of co college coaches are interested in somebody like that. Uh, yeah. You know, if I put myself back into my own body when I was young and I was like trying out for coaches, I did, I wanted them to know that I cared. Right. So, like, part of me, I feel like I must have been telling myself, like, hey, make sure you show that you're pissed off. Like, they're, they're going to like that you're upset about this mistake but i don't know i think it's okay to to do a quick to, to show a little quick upset or like punch your hand but then yeah. how quickly can you bounce back from that not how deeply do you care about every point to the point where you're going to sulk for for two minutes but can you bounce back quickly mm -hmm. yeah yeah and that's what great players can do they make the mistake and they go into analysis mode instead of critical mode because if you analyze and you think okay what can i do better in the next play instead of the negative self-talk oh i'm bad it just takes you longer to get out of that and you know what is there seven ten seconds in between plays it's not a long time <clears throat> Do you have a, a process or anything that you ask your players to tell themselves immediately after like big mistakes? Is, is there a breathe? Is there a tell yourself? Is there one thing or do you say find a way to X? So we, we do talk about, you know, a routine, whether it is as a server or as a receiver, because that's how the game begins. You're either on defense or on offense and I, I, and having that routine be something that calms you. Uh, for some of them, it involves a breath. Uh, for some of them, it might be holding my partner's hand for a minute. I got middle, you got this, you got that. But, um, and 
also we know we're big on uh, positive self-talk and analyzing not criticizing okay analyzing not criticizing so instead of what blaming yourself blaming the last thing saying what could i have done better or what went wrong yes i think it's always what could i do better in that play so trying to problem solve for us problem solving is huge at practice mm -hmm. and often you know again and this is good advice for coaches is that we know as as, as a coach with a well-trained eye we know what happened in the play but it doesn't really do a lot of good to the player. This happens a lot indoors, right? The kids make a mistake, boom, I start on the coach and the coach has all the answers. And I of like- Of course, they, because they just saw it, like it happened. I love yeah. when people coach retroactively. When, of course, you look like a genius after the play. <laughs> you know? and, and, you can, and you can do that in a beach practice as well, but it's ultimately not the best thing for a player because I think beach players are greater at problem solving, good beach players, because they don't have the coach during the game. Their coaching is very limited in, in beach volleyball, so they have to be great problem solvers. And as a result, you got to train that in practice. So, you know, often when a player makes a mistake, instead of volunteering what I saw, it's better to ask the player, you know, what did you feel there? What could you have done better there? What would you do different next time? Because this way they, they learn to problem solve. And, and is they're not going to have all the answers right away. So, for example, at our practices, if I ask that to a beginner, they're going to immediately say, oh, I, I serve bad. <laughs> okay, so then we got <laughs> we got to teach them to, uh, instead of I serve bad, okay, what made the serve go in the net and just kind of guide them to discovery so they learn to problem solve. So it's a process that, you know, a 12 year old beginner and then one of our 16 year old uh, girls that are already committed to college are in a totally different spectrum of ability to problem solve because they've been trained to do so. <laughs> we had a, a kid, a freshman on our team in college at George Mason University. His name was Joe Norton. And our coach was very cerebral, Fred Chow. He would always ask those questions and he, you know, and try to dig into the reasoning. And he's like, Joe, you know, what he got blocked hard. And he goes, Joe, what what were you trying to do with that swing? And he just kind of froze and he goes, uh honestly coach i was just trying to hit it as hard as i could <laughs> and like we all laughed you know yeah. he was like so honest he didn't even try yeah. to make anything smart up yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we all laughed and we were like okay uh, let's dig a little deeper like uh, next time let's have a little thought process and uh he became a really really strong player and now he's a coach himself actually so he's probably asking those questions of, uh, of his own freshman yeah mm. so Let's talk a little bit about um, a little bit about first of all Southern California versus the rest of the country, and I want to know if you think and why you think uh, there might be a competitive difference. Do you think that the gap is closing, or do you think it's still really significantly different? It's like California maybe now Florida and then everyone else? Because well, I've, I've seen players from the Midwest who are absolutely crushing it. And you're like, whoa, where'd you come from, Ohio? You know? Yeah, so I want to say that uh, certainly, you know, we can't say, you know, um, six years ago, we could say that Southern California had the best. Uh, and, and I'm talking juniors, junior beach volleyball. And that's not the case anymore. I mean, uh, Texas. Uh, uh, won the last two uh, BBC national championships, and um, I think one of one of the differences is that in Calif Southern California we have a lot of clubs. Therefore, the talent is more like diluted or spread all over. Where oh. you know, 
uh, some of these clubs kind of have a monopoly of, of, of the really good girls. So I think that makes a difference. But also, you know, at least what I've noticed uh, this past year, they're just <laughs> bigger and more athletic. Uh, I feel that these are incredibly, incredibly skilled, uh, but we're maybe just not as big and as athletic as the as the Texas kids. Hmm. Do you think that's a training thing, like like a mentality of our, our Texas kids? Are they just fed more meat? You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to know where they're eating. <laughs> you got to stop with the kale salads down in California. <laughs> and like... <laughs> and then you have a pot of toast. <laughs> <laughs> uh, is, it, is it like a different thing mindset? Are they, are they spending typically more time in the drill uh, in the gym? Well, you know, I, I just think that like when I think about uh, nationals and we came in second place and, and the, the people that were playing, it's just on, on almost every level, we were outdone by a couple inches and they're just bigger, more athletic kids. And, you know, that is just, it's just, it's just hard to, to argue and, and, and fight with physicality uh and they're very well trained i'll give my you know my hats off to them they're doing a really good job yeah right okay so you think that that gap is now kind of closing and would you to say that they're they're well trained mm -hmm. do you think that you can find out of nowhere a club that is crushing it because of one specific personality or person there like are we going to see Tennessee start upgrading their clubs because all of a sudden John Hayden showed up and he's going to now add to that bucket of like what Volus has been doing and maybe you know C2 from Chattanooga they're they're indoor are are we going to start seeing because there's one person there now with smart smart good high level training is that going to upgrade um, and can somebody moving to a new place have a big effect on that region? I think that certainly helps, you know, to have a leader that cares and, and is, is growing the sport uh, for the right reasons. Is possible that is going to increase the competitiveness. Uh, but, uh, you know, I mean, so far is California, Texas, I mean, Florida a little bit, but I mean, oh, really, it's inter that's, it's so interesting it. to hear you say that that Texas is now coming like ahead of Florida, yeah. and Florida might be oh, not completely out of the equation. But. Yeah, way ahead. Uh huh. Hmm. Interesting. What are the other like uh, under under top five? Who who do you think are the comers that the uh, that juniors clubs and and athletes are just being turned out? We're like, oh. They're starting to figure it out in this club or this region. Um, there is a club in Spokane area that I got to. We competed against some of their kids, and you can just tell that they're they're doing things pretty well. I think Outrigger in Hawaii is doing a nice job with their athletes. But they have, you know, good coaching with Evan Silverstein there. He's the coach mm -hmm. at the University of Hawaii. Uh, but certainly not just, uh, um, I mean, there's different clubs in Texas that are doing a nice job with their kids. Uh, a couple of clubs in uh, Phoenix, Arizona, also doing a good job so, uh, in Seattle um, as well. So, you know, they're, they're coming from all over the place. Beach volleyball at the junior level has grown dramatically. Uh, it's, it's amazing how much better and how early the, the kids are now compared to 10 years ago. Mm. Do you think that uh, we're going to see any sort of drop in the skill level at the indoor level? You know, are, are all of those indoor kids going to come over to the beach because they can get more touches, they have a little more control of their destiny? And that's kind of why I stopped playing when I was playing overseas indoor. I said, you know, I feel like I have more control over my destiny because it's just about me finding a partner. Okay, I can do that and and then winning. And so I stopped indoor because I was like, eh, I don't want to be selected by a coach or anything like that. I, I thought I could just win my way. 
forward. So do you think that, you know, there's, there's going to be a big difference in those type of athletes or are there just too many athletes in volleyball now and both sports are just going to continue to accelerate? Yeah, I, I don't have the statistics of how many girls play uh, indoor club at the youth level versus uh, beach club. Mm. But, uh, but certainly, I think players are starting to understand that when they play beach, they improve faster. Just in the sheer fact that you're touching the ball three times more. And uh, so, for example, at our club, I, I feel that we cater to both, uh, to, to actually three athletes, the recreational athlete that just wants to learn beach volleyball because it's a life skill, the indoor athlete that's using beach volleyball as a uh, complement or, or a supplement, because even if you come and practice once a week, you're going to see dramatic improvement in your overall game because all of a sudden you're not specialized into being a libero or, or a middle, you get to um, be good at everything. And then we, we obviously cater to the beach only athlete that is really trying to, to play college. And uh, more and more kids every year, we're seeing that they're giving up indoors, um, sometimes it's early. Uh, we just, I just got the announcement of one of them, seventh grade, I uh, just gave up indoors. Um, she happens to be really, really good um, to do beach only. And certainly, if you want to make a push towards playing college, that at least your sophomore year, you should be concentrating in, in beach. Otherwise, you put yourself at a disadvantage come June 15, which is the first official date of, of recruiting for all sophomores. Hmm. Okay. I apologize. I, we got uh, cut out there. I didn't hear a bunch of that, <laughs> but I'm, I'm glad I took the audience through it. Um, I'm a, I think a big part, I don't know why, why indoor players hate or indoor coaches are hating the move to beach so much, or maybe fearing beach clubs. You know, it's, I see a lot of, all right, if we can't beat them, join them. So now I'm seeing a lot of indoor clubs, they're so worried about losing their kids to a beach club that they just start their own beach club kind of begrudgingly sometimes mm -hmm. where it's like, it, this should be good. And then the, the, the kind of arguments that I think are bogus are, well, they're not going to learn how to, how to pass with their hands, which is super valuable um, for indoor. I mean, I, okay, I guess, but aren't they going to become expert platform passers then? It's not that they're not, they're not going to learn it. Right, they can learn it back in indoor. Now they're just getting double, triple the reps with their platforms, which has benefit. And then the whole setting discussion, you know, that all these beach players come back now and and they don't know how to set. They're lifting the ball in indoor. I was always able to make a, a very quick difference. Like, mm -hmm. hey, now I'm playing indoor, my hands are faster. Now I'm playing beach, my hands are slower. So I don't know where these arguments are coming from. Other than coach, just say, hey, speed up your hands. This is indoor. Or slow down your hands. This is beach. But do you, do you know why indoor clubs are fearing this? Do you think they should? I don't think they should. I think that there are so many 5'7 to 5'10 outside hitters. There's just so many of them. And... And to be honest with you, if you are that height and you want to play Division One college, it is going to be very, very difficult. Uh, you have to be a phenom 5A outside hitter to play Division One college these days. So that the, those same kids have a little bit higher chances of playing in college through beach volleyball because maybe their ball control is amazing and they can, you know, have a, a great offense. And um, so there, there is room for those kids. Should indoor clubs be fearing it? No. Uh, I think a little bit sometimes it can be either ignorance um, when they're feeding the kids. Oh, don't, you, you're not allowed because I get this sometimes. You're not allowed to play beach uh during indoor club season because they're not teaching fundamentals it's going to screw up your timing and hitting it's going to screw up your setting 
they don't, you know, the passing. So there's just, there's a lot, there's a lot of excuses, but I think for the most part, the indoor clubs, at least around in my area, understand mm -hmm. the value of the kids maybe doing one out, one practice a week because it's making their kids better um, and just having um, better ball control. And like you said, I think if, if you play enough, you're going to be able to make those changes. Hey, I'm indoors. I got to release faster. I'm at the beach. I can hold the ball a little bit more. Um, I we actually were just participating in the tournament this past weekend. And I mean, game one, we were rusty, you know, as hitters because all the girls are playing in their high school right now. Yeah. And we were early. We were hitting out. You know, we're just uh, brought jump. Jumping, and then literally that was Saturday morning, and then by by the end of, of day two, our last game in the in the finals, uh, we were back to our normal beach volleyball mode, and the girls play great. And but you know they need to figure those things out on their own. Yeah, it's always that discussion is just it's just always so tough, and I, and I don't know where it comes from because it doesn't. It doesn't just it doesn't make sense to me when they do argue it when they say that you're ruining the skills or yeah. that you're you're taking this he goes, no i'm getting them so many more touches than you i mean if you're gonna fire back at them which is not the way to handle it but yeah. it's like i'm getting them twice as many touches i'm teaching a middle how to read like aren't you tired of seeing your middles go back row and indoor and just like letting a ball fall or getting hit in the head like hey now they actually understand what it's like to peel and dig or be on the ground and return a shot and yes. it makes me think that i mean i did this a lot uh, when i was coaching indoor club uh, as well as at queen's college and i said hey we're gonna break up into groups of three and we're going to play so much threes. We're going to play more threes than we are sixes because we have the court space. Or if you don't have the court space, all right, divide it down the middle. And now you have, you know, a, a two, two person courts yeah. and the touches there, instead of getting one touch every six minutes, when you're playing six on six volleyball, it's like, it's crazy how little you touch the ball. If you count the number for me, reps per minute is a big thing that I track. I keep track of. And when I'm like studying my coaches, making sure that they're kind of doing it right. I'll just, I'll start a watch and I'll follow one person. And I'll say, how many times did this one person touch the ball in a minute, two minutes, three minutes. And then I'll go over there during the next water break. And I'll tell my coach, Hey, Sarah touched the ball once in a four minute period because of the rotation or because of what's going on. And I see this all the time as well. Like now that I'm watching my nephews, I, I see this at baseball practices, football mm -hmm. practices. I have a kid coming in seven months, my first kid, which I'm fired up about. And I'm like, what kind of parent am I going to be? Am I going to be the parent coach? Like I'm, I'm never going to butt in on a coach, <laughs> but the way that I'm watching my nephews practice right now, to me, I go, I won't be able to tolerate this. So I guess I'm just going to be the guy that coaches all of his kids' teams, you know, <laughs> because I want to see like reps per minute when I see nine kids in an outfield in baseball and one kid gets to throw and catch once in a four minute period. How is this a valuable use of time? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think more indoor coaches could be served by breaking into small groups consistently station work small group work two on two three on three work and then all right now that they've got a ton of touches like last 30 20 minutes let's move to sixes because you have to understand how everything else works mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean it's it's crazy to think that for every ball played in an indoor game that 23 kids are watching you and it could be higher than it could be it could be that's wild it could be higher than that because some team some teams carry more than twelve, and then for every ball that is played in beach, only three kids watch. So um, yeah, the number is three times. The numbers are staggering. About and that's why you get better faster playing beach. Mm, I like it. Okay, uh, we're, we're gonna start to wind down here, but I, I do want to know if you have any advice for players to just. To how can they as quickly as possible get to the next level if 
they don't have a big program around them, if they don't have coaches near where they are, but they're hooked, you know, and this, this goes for juniors. This also goes for the adults. Like a lot of adults listen to this podcast and they say, I don't have the players near me. Nobody's running classes. Nobody's coaching, but I love this and I want to get better fast. Okay. So, um, I think trying to find three people that don't have to be your age, your gender, but you know, I mean, literally you just, you need four people that share your interest in the game so that you could set up games. And there is, there is a huge value in unstructured play. I mean, I tell my kids, Yes, I'd love to come and see see you at practice, but you guys got to go play for fun on your own because that's like, you know, pick up games in basketball. You just got to go play, play, play. Let's say that you don't have access to four people all the time. Maybe it's just you and a partner. Then try and play one-on-one, -on -one, you know, maybe a quarter of the core, maybe skinny volleyball, just play one-on-one -on -one as much as possible. And, but you know, you see it always over the net, over the net. You know, if you if you pepper, you get really good at pepper, and uh, pepper never happens in a game. So <laughs> pepper over the net, uh, play over the net, so that you can learn the game faster. And um, you know, and then obviously, any any time you get a chance to compete, do it. Go to go to any tournament, tape yourself so that you learn to see what you need to do. Uh, you need to get better at what you need to do better, and um, just play, play as much as possible. Don't have access to a coach. Videotape, watch the great ones, watch the pros do it, and try to emulate what you see on video. Mm, I like that. I, I like the over the net uh discussion about that i it brought me back to it, i was playing in australia with jeremy casebeer for uh, about five months and a lot of times we didn't have anybody so we just drew a line down the middle of the court and we played line to line three touch right so you dig oh, you set, yeah. you hit and then we yeah. played diagonal three touch and then you play the other oh, diagonal so you're hitting on the left side exhausting. so exhausting yeah, another movie drill, if you only have two people, since we're at it, is play two versus zero. And if you want to get warm that fast, play two versus zero. So let's say you and I are on the same side of the net, mm. and we pass set roll chat high. So you have time to go underneath the net to bump. I go underneath the net. I set you your roll shot high, so I have time to go underneath the net. So it's like playing literally past set, but it has to be a high roll shot. You can't hit it because otherwise my partner can't get it. <laughs> but if you want to get warm fast and have your ball control become excellent, wow, that's a quick way to do it. We, we do it with our kids as a warm up, but it becomes a competition. Who could keep the rally alive the longest? Oh, I like that. Always competing. I mean, as much as we can, there's some element of competition at our practices. I like that. Yeah, yeah, you can always just write it down, do it again the next day, and say, hey, you know, let's see if we can just do this drill for yeah. three minutes. I mean, that would be, oh, you'd yeah. be gassed three minutes. after three one, minutes. One minute. <laughs> <laughs> one minute and they're, <laughs> yeah, you're in very good shape. That's a great drill. I like that. I like that. Okay. Patty, I, I, I know you're in a rush for time, so I don't want to hold you on to you for too long, but I do, uh, is there any way that anybody can reach out to you? Do you have any programs, other programs going on that you really want to talk about? I, I, I know you're crushing it over at MB Sand in Manhattan Beach, um, and Beach Nation is running beach volleyball coaching clinics as well as recruiting clinics for coaches and players. Um, is there anything else that you want people to know about and – is there any way for anybody to reach out to you if they have any questions on any of that? Okay, so another another uh, passion of mine is working for USA Volleyball. So I assist with our senior national team, and I also coach a lot for our junior national team through the National Team Development Program. So we actually have a webinar this Sunday. It's all on hand setting. 
Oh, and nice. um, as far as uh, ways to reach me, uh, you know, follow us at, on Instagram at MBCN BBC, my volleyball club. Uh, you can direct message me there. And if you want to uh, talk shop, you have questions about coaching, I'm, I'm always happy to share. I mean, knowledge is, is to be shared and not to be, not to be taken to the grave. <laughs> I like that. I like that. Well, Pat, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it for your expertise, for everything that you have already done and continue to do for the sport, players, coaches, directors, and the national program. Um, the whole country appreciates your guidance and your leadership. So for those of you who don't know Patty, reach out to her, follow her, understand what she's doing, and that she is an absolute juggernaut of a resource for you for coaching for directing for playing uh so she's absolutely somebody that you have to pay attention to and uh she just gave you the invite to reach out so if you've got any questions go ahead and, and follow it and it's on the bottom of our screen right now uh but if you are listening on the podcast or just an audio version of this check out the show notes and we have included every single one of her links below there as well as her bio if you want to learn more about her all right. Well, thank you. And thank you for growing the sport, Mark. <laughs> thank you, Patty. All Have right. a great day. <laughs> Bye-bye.